Welcome in, everybody. It is another episode of Scarves and Spikes, the ratings episode. We are going to be doing a little th things a little bit differently today. We have uh, obviously no Sydney. Sydney is enjoying a Braves game currently. Tommy is recovering from his botched plastic surgery. Yep. Allegedly. I'm pretty. He's not in witness protection anymore. <laughs> How are you feeling? Eh, you know, eh, when you hear the word shingles, you think of like your grandpa and grandma, like getting something not you know when you're turning 40 18. but uh it's i've covered up you know covered up a lot of it and you know I'm, i feel like i i've sent the uh what was it, the hunchback of notre dame like <laughs> memed everybody where it just says i'm a monster like when people are like hey you want to hang out this weekend i just send the i'm a monster gif and just go back to bed and i was hoping hoping on saturday to just sit down on the deck Watching Atlanta United game, not get stressed out because shingles are caused by stress, yep. I found out. And now it's all making sense after watching most of the season and the past couple of years. It's all just caught up to me. So I call this workers' compensation, and I've sent my ER bill to Atlanta United. Awesome. Well, they have we'll some money if, to pay it. If, if, yeah, I mean, they got some money back for our Rougeous, so they could yeah. probably pay my you know, $700 ER bill. Yeah. You'll be all right. And they'll still have leftover for a DP, allegedly. Yeah. We'll see. <laughs> my DP. The DP is my ER bill. <laughs> <laughs> you can thank Tommy, guys, for, for no DP in the summer transfer window. <laughs> my bad. <laughs> all right. So, yeah, we're going to do things a little bit differently today. Obviously, we're, we, we had our mid-season review over on Patreon. We're just past the halfway mark of the season. The... Match Saturday did not go well, and it stressed Tommy out more. <laughs> it stressed everybody out more. <laughs> and it, it's becoming a bit of a recurring theme, I think. You know, the, the team is not at the point where they're in LA Galaxy or Toronto just firing Bob Bradley. Like, the team's not falling apart, but the team is not playing the way they need to be playing. And I don't think anybody can deny that. So, in lieu of doing actual player ratings, we're going to talk a little bit differently today, and we're going to play the blame game. because The blame game! There it is. Everybody, not on, not just on social media, but everybody that we hear here on the radio, uh, just in casual conversation, is, hey, who do we blame for the way Atlanta United is playing right now? So we're going to talk about it, and we're going to talk about who is to blame for not just the Red Bulls match, but in general, what's going on with the with the team right now. So, yeah, I mean, it's 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 a big thing, right? Like it's it's huge. Like you go on anytime there's something good that happens, that they're they're saying this person, this person's getting it. But when it goes bad, you know, you're seeing the Pineda out, you're seeing the Boca, you're seeing them combined together into a baby, right? Like they both need to go. Um, and, and you see the players and a lot of times it oh, seems like there's only one player that really gets a lot of, a lot of grief. And I think you know who that is. Yes. He's a wall. He has yes. a lot less hair than me, but I mean, Brad like, not, but not by much. <laughs> I mean, like he, he gets a lot of the blame, but like not a lot of other players really get it. It's. These players are getting blamed on because of the coaching staff and, and things like that. So we thought, you know, let's let's, t you know, just talk about it here and, and get at least our thoughts. And then we'd love for people to jump in and, and give us your thoughts, but give a reason why as well. Like It's just it's easy to say Pineda out or Boca out. And I'm sure if you say Boca out, you probably have got a laundry list of things on, on Boca out. So. Just prepare to type a lot if that's your if that's your answer here. But like you know, especially if, if we're talking about the players and the coaching staff, we would really like you to jump in and just give your thoughts on on why that that person is one of the main people that you're that you're blaming for some of this. Yeah, absolutely, and and that's the thing. Why? Like, answer the why question because we're going to try to do that. These are our opinions. Not really. This is a scientific method that's proven with the whiteboard. These are our opinions, um, and so we're going to. We're going to do what we can to, to talk about it and, and give you what we think. But at the end of the day, it's what we think. And, you know, uh, if, if you think Tiago Almada is playing like garbage and he needs to go, please tell us why. If you think this is all Brad's fault, please tell us why. We're not 
telling you that you're right or wrong. We just want to know why. We want to know what, what everybody else thinks. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Like Tommy said, drop the comments. Uh, head on over. If you're, if you're not already subscribed on YouTube, definitely subscribe to us. We appreciate it. It helps us a lot. And uh, also, I'll do the quick plug for Patreon, patreon.com slash Scarves and Spikes as well. Go hop over there. Got the watch-alongs coming. First one. A, a big one. A big watch-along. Is going to be uh, the first time Messi plays Atlanta United here in right out a month. It's very close. So if you're not going down, which I don't imagine many people are at this point because they can't afford it, uh, jump on the Patreon. It's much more affordable, and you'll get to have drinks and have fun with us and watch apparently Messi play in his first match against an MLS team. So, Woo. yay. All right. With that being said, we'll dive right into it. The blame game. The first one, because that seems to be where everybody's head's at right now. The coaching slash tactics. So we put this one together. But Pineda, coaching staff, the way the team is playing as far as the tactics that are presented on the field, the whole nine yards. So as a whole, we're still going to do our ratings, but we're going to give you guys our opinions behind our ratings after. So... Tommy. So what are we doing here? Are we doing a one through ten here? On what? Yeah. How we'll much of it's it the blame? Yeah, we'll yeah we'll we'll keep it simple. Okay. The same way it's always been. This is this is a hard one. It is hard. It is hard. There's different ways to like really think about this. Yeah. Um, especially like when we do spaces, like people come in and 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 they have their takes, and some of them are interesting. But like I think my favorite part about spaces is I have my own opinion. And then after I get off spaces and talk to other people, I'm like, you know, I didn't think of that before. Yeah. And I hope like people think of the same things that I say and like think about it later. But some people yeah. are just saying, screw Tommy, Pineda out. <laughs> Shut up, Tommy. I mean, people might not like my rating here, but like <clears throat> at the end of the day, they're just my opinions, man. All right. Like, I like to think I know a little something about the game, but at the end of the day, I'm not the one getting paid money to fix it. I'm just a dude sitting here doing a podcast. So. <laughs> All right. And writing articles. Cool. What you got? I'm going to say six. I was going to go with five. Five for me. So, all right. I get the lower one. I'll, uh, I'll dive into it. So, here's the thing. I think what Pineda is trying to do, and his coaching staff as a whole, I think that if it were to click and, and you had the right players – here to make it happen and that's not to say every player on this team is not the right player but there's a handful in very important positions that are not executing the game plan and you know we can sit here and say well we're, we're just going to do it until it sticks and it works because why change it up this is the way we want to play so we're not going to change it up like I, I get that mindset we talked to rod underwood head coach of chattanooga one of our first guests on the show earlier this year and he said, you, I set up my team because we, we play the way that we want to play, and I don't tell them to change it up because why would we go out of our way to play a different style that we're not going to play on any other day? We're going to play the way that we know how to play. And I get that. However, I also think you've got to be pragmatic. And in – the Red Bulls, obviously, it's the most recent one. It's the one on everybody's mind right now, right? The Red Bulls play an incredibly aggressive, high-pressing style of football. That's what they're known for. It's not like you, you this was a surprise at all. Like They didn't come out and throw a wrench in your plans and say, hey, guess what? We're going we're gonna to come at you hard today. That's what they do. That's what they're known for for years. So it's already been shown this year that when you play against teams, when Atlanta plays against teams that that really want to push you, really want to press hard, really want to make it uncomfortable to be on the ball, Atlanta struggles. Now, they've had moments in, in matches. I mean, they beat the Red Bulls at home 1-0 earlier this year. Uh, you can thank Yakamakis for that one. Grittiest but, performance of the year. Yeah. Yeah. So, at the same time, though, like, you that was one of your most narrow wins and you had to change things up a little bit in that match 
when you're going against a team, especially away, and you already know what they're doing, and now you have a history of you're you're sticking with the four two three one, whatever you want to call it. Essentially, I mean, it changes in the game, but you're sticking with your game plan, which is we're going to play out of the back, we're going to be brave, we're going to move the ball up the field, out of the back, not just pinging it long over the top. You are setting yourself up for a frustrating night if every one of your players, especially in the midfield, are not perfect on the ball. And you look at this Red Bulls match, and they were not perfect on the ball, not even kind of. But this didn't just start. It it goes back, honestly, a couple of months now, and we started seeing some of the sloppiness on the ball, some of the – it didn't look like they really desired to be out there in certain matches. And that's not every match. You know, it, it's such a weird switch that flips. Like there's some, some days they come out there and they clearly want to be the better team and are the better team. But the difference is usually that's against teams that allow you to have the ball a little bit better. And this is not 2022 where you couldn't finish chances. Now you have a guy up top and others that are finishing these chances. So you're moving the ball against teams that aren't really – pushing you hard but the moment they start to push some of these players especially in the midfield things get dicey and so that's where you have to be in my opinion more pragmatic and Pineda has to come in not just as a 70th minute switch which he did roughly uh, he did in this Red Bulls match put two strikers up top change things around a little bit and I actually think that was probably the way you should have started the match but it's other matches as well the, the, the league knows what you're trying to do. They know how Atlanta want, wants to play. And 80% of your matches playing that, that style, playing out of the back, possession, it's going to get you results. It has. But when it comes time to switch things up against a team where you know their play style as well, and you know that your play styles are completely polar opposite of each other, you either got to come out from the opening whistle with something different, or you have to make those changes way, way earlier when it becomes clear that it's not working. And it was pretty clear very early on that this team was not able to handle playing out of the back the way that they're being trained to. You got to change it up quicker. You got to change things up, make something else happen. And I give credit to Pineda because, you know, I think it kind of goes under the radar. There are so many times this season where, he, he does make these late game subs and and it's not just subs like there's there's tactical switches and formational switches and everything else and it's gotten this team results so I give him credit but I think there's something to be said to come out against a Red Bulls team or Philly that's also going to press you pretty hard uh, next week and just throw a wrench throw a wrench in their plans and say all right we're I don't know we're lining up with with a back three three center backs or back five you know I mean whatever you want to call it And we're doing something a little different. You've got a a long week, relatively, to drill it as hard as you want. But I don't know that playing the same style is going to work against Philly either. And Philly's a better team than the Red Bulls. So it's it's a mixture, right? Pineda, I think he's making changes. I think maybe at times they're coming too late. But ultimately what I would like to see is this team coming in with the ability to have a plan B and dive into it like ASAP. The moment things are just not clicking right, then you make that change, even if it's 15 minutes into the match. Like when it becomes clear, that's when you make the switch. And I think that that's where I, I, my biggest frustration is with maybe some of the tactics. I think my that's fair. <laughs> yeah, it's fair. I You look at some of these games like, the Columbus game that was a disaster. Like, you know, it, it felt like he just kept saying, "Let's get, wait till halftime, and then let's regroup." Right? They were only down one nothing, I think, at that point, and then they allowed one like right at the end. And then you go in the second half, you're down two nothing. It's it's almost you know not almost impossible, but it's it's a lot harder to come you know back from there. And this this kind of felt like the same situation. Like they were just trying to just stay alive there for a little bit and then it was already too late when they made some of these changes right like why wasn't there any changes just made at half like why do we wait 10 minutes to to make some of this like it wasn't working at all and when you think of the overall product and i think the biggest thing for me for years has been this team has come out to some really terrible starts 
And the argument has been Pineda doesn't get them ready. Okay. But then why aren't the players ready? And that's why my number here, I didn't know what to choose because I think that's one of the biggest parts of this team is just slow starts. You know, Doug's going to post every time Atlanta United allows the first goal, what the record is when Atlanta allows the first goal. It's terrible, uh, you know, and this team can't play from behind. I mean, they they can, but they have to come from behind in the last 10 minutes or it doesn't count. It's it's not going to happen here, but Patton's those some of point. these games could get out of control. And in this league, I know it's only the midseason, but you if you get past this new best of three round, it's single elimination. And I don't trust this team to go into a single elimination game and be ready. So I'm still trying to figure out in my head, who is it on? Is it on the players or the coaching staff? And for me, I don't think it's on the coaching staff. I don't I don't think that that is at, at all. I think that they're setting them up. Pineda's got his plans, and he's ready to go, and these players just aren't ready to go for some reason. And at, at this point, if you're a professional, you know, you don't go and question, like, if if Messi comes out and not he's not he's having a bad first half are you blaming the coach and saying oh well the coach didn't get messy ready to play like that's just it, it doesn't seem like that's going to happen so like i'm trying to think of like superstars out there right like of, of any sport and you're going to say well oh well no the, the coach it's the coach's fault because he didn't get them ready for for this game they're all professionals man and and i'm actually talking myself into a lower number now because there are some people that are ready every time they hit that field. You know who they are? They're the kids. Yeah. These kids come on the field and they are ready to go. And why are, why are we not giving Panita credit for these kids? Like the, you know, they're coming in and I shouldn't call them kids, but you know what I mean? Like the homegrowns. Like the yeah. homegrowns are coming in and they're making immediate impacts in almost every single game. And that's that's where we're going to get into the the next one the players like that's making me think more and more that it isn't a Pineda thing. You know, maybe, you know, there's there's coaches out there that some are really good at motivating younger players. And there's some that are good with veterans. And maybe maybe that is something. Maybe he's just better to motivating some of the younger, you know, players that are that are coming up here. Maybe he would be the best, you know, uh, MLS next pro coach out there because he's just so good at, at doing them. Maybe he's good at developing and that's what he's good at. But like these young players are coming in and they're motivated as can be. And you usually see uh, just a huge change of pace when it's out there. And I don't, I, I, I think that that's something very positive that for Pineda here, because that's what they did in Seattle, right? That's what they were known for. They were able to bring in young players when needed and they were very motivated to play. And we're here. We're here right now in Atlanta. Like you're watching this happen as we go. Tyler Wolf is having a fantastic season. Chol is making an impact. Like maybe he's not scoring all the goals, but he's definitely having an impact, which Absolutely. I didn't think I was ever going to see with Machop. Like I did not think that he was really going to become anything. Just it it didn't seem like it was moving along fast enough, right? You know, Firmino it comes in and scores like and he's having a hell of a week. Yeah, like that's absolutely. Like you mentioned what happened last night. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, he's just having a fantastic week. I mean, F- Fortune is, is is you know he had a nice goal yesterday, but he he's made a a, a great impression uh, on the team so far. So I, I'm a, I'm actually going to go less here. I, I'm I'm changing my answer from six to a four, uh, because I I don't I don't really think it's that this is on Pineda. Okay, so the lower number just to. To clarify for everybody listening, maybe after the fact or watching, whatever. The lower number being it's less of their fault. Yes. Okay. Cool. So Glad we're on the same page. If I didn't, we would have been really confused. Oh, yeah. Well, no. But, hey, I, I give a five, so it didn't matter for me. <laughs> um, but, no, that's, that's exactly it, though. I, I think, you know, like you might, you might take a player on any, any given day that has a, a crapper. And give them all they. I mean, you got a nine on that one because that was mostly your fault. You know, you gave whatever. Uh, but no, for this, yeah, the lower the number, the less you take a part in the blame game, I guess. 
You um, know, r- real quick, do you what was Caleb Wiley's quote um, after the game about like that the players didn't come out ready? Yeah, he essentially said they just didn't want it enough. They didn't want it as as much as the rebels did, and and they knew that. They, they knew what they were getting into, obviously, like I said a minute ago. You know what you're getting into when you go play the Rebels. And he said that they just weren't energetic enough. They didn't they didn't bring it the way they should have. And uh, Who do you think he was blaming? In front of me. Who do you think? We'll, we'll have it for, I guess, the show on Wednesday. But, like, you hear that comment. Who do you think that he's calling out here? Because I, I saw everybody immediately go to Pineda. And I was, I just put my, my phone down. Yeah. Do you think he was calling out his his fellow players? I think so. I mean, I do too. I would I would if I was in that situation. I mean, I think the biggest thing is just accountability and I mean, you know, I understand why this club especially now doesn't necessarily call folks out individually. I mean, Pineda even even after this match, <clears throat> he talked about you know, was asked about Almada and why he's not been as involved in the attack and everything else. Um and he talked about how he would he wouldn't discuss specifics in public, but he was going to deal with it privately. Um, so that's a different topic entirely. But at the same time, I think occasionally it's OK to just say, hey, man, yeah, he had a crappy game tonight, but we're going to go back to the training ground. We're going to go back to the, the film review. We're going to do everything we got to do and we're going to get it back straight. But. You know, I think I think it's okay. Okay, it's not okay to get up there and dog somebody. You know, week in and week out. But holding people accountable is absolutely something that I think is is acceptable. And I wish we saw a little bit more of that. And you know, Caleb makes a comment like that. Who knows? Who knows who he was talking about? He could have been talking about himself and, and everybody for all we know. But I definitely think, like, if you just look at the game, it's pretty clear that there was quite a few that just they didn't bring it. I mean, and to your point. These younger guys are coming out and they're hungry. They, and I, I, I said it on our shows before. We've talked about it. You've talked about it. They're hungry. They want to play this game. They want to be getting more minutes. I always go back to Tyler Wolf. When I was down in Orlando and him and Brad both talked about how it's so hard for a homegrown or a young guy to break into an MLS squad, especially one like Atlanta that brings in talent from everywhere else. It's hard for the homegrowns to break in. Well, he's done it successfully. Uh, Machop's done it pretty successfully. Nick Firmino is well on his way to doing it successfully. Um, and there's, there's plenty of other names. I mean, obviously Caleb did it. There's plenty of others here, you know, that they, they take their chance when it's given because they're hungry and they want it. And I think my biggest thing when we're talking about, and, and this is the perfect time to segue into the players part, but complacency kills. And I think you get some folks that they are complacent because maybe, they feel like they don't have to fight for that starting spot all the time. And, you know, that's that's definitely something from a coaching perspective. You, you have to stand up and say, oh, hey, man, you, you dropped a, a crapper again. So to the bench it is, and we're putting somebody else in front of you. And then y'all are going to have to fight it out in training and, and work your way back up. To, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, chemistry is one thing. I get it. You want to keep the chemistry built, but – at the end of the day, if an individual player is causing mistakes that are leaking goals or whatever, not allowing you to score goals, then they've got to they've got to come off the pitch. So, small quote, real small quote, but like Brooks Lennon said, when everybody was gone international break, one of their best practices they they had was when they had all all you know the the twos there and and working with them. Just interesting that now that you say that and that immediate, that quote immediately came to my head. I think it's I think it's a big deal. I think people underestimate you may not be the most talented, you may not be the best on the ball, you may not be b- the best positionally, but if you want it, Tyler Wolf is a perfect example. The fact that the guy just plays fundamental winger football and makes a run to the back post all the time when you had a, a what 12 million dollar DP that didn't want to make that run all the time and he scored more goals now in what a thousand minutes less than the twelve million dollar DP did, just because he's playing fundamental, basic soccer, and he's hungry. He wants it. I think there's something to be said for that. Being in the right place is is, is part of the job. Yep. So with that, what would you give the players? Keeping in mind here, 
again, for everybody listening, I'll preface it again. The higher number, you got more blame. The lesser number, you got less blame. I wanted to make this equal 10, like do a nice formula, but I'm not, I can't do that. I can't, I can't. <laughs> no, I can't do that. No, I could have, I'm but. I'm about to be thrown off a lot here. All right. What you got? Eight. 7.5 for me. <laughs> you got to go first again. Yeah. All right. Um, piggybacking off what we were just talking about specifically, but there are players, and you watch them, you watch the body language, you watch the way they play on the pitch, and you see ones that consistently just seem to want to be there day in and day out. They bring the energy day in and day out. And I, I can't sit here and I would never try to sit here and just imagine and put words into people's mouth about what their motivation is and why they go up and down. Because at the end of the day, like we're all people. These players are people. They're not robots. They're going to have good games. They're going to have bad games. And everybody needs to understand that. That's how it is. I think the best players in the world, the most consistent players in the world, find a way to motivate themselves and motivate their team to no matter the, the tactics that you're playing with, no matter the formation, no matter what else is going on, you control the things that you can control. And the one thing that you can control is what you bring to the pitch every time you step onto it. It's nice to be able to leak that to other people, the other you know 10 guys on the pitch, but you control what you can control. And when you see you know guys making runs and they're not being rewarded, or you see nobody making runs and the, the guys wanting to reward them and there's nobody making that effort to make the run, um, or you see sloppy touches or bad passes or you know whatever, Yes, some of it is is something that you have to solve on the training ground in terms of just you've got to you've got to be better. But you're playing a, you're playing a style of football, admittedly, in in Pineda system, where especially the midfield has to be spot on on the ball all the time. You have to you have to control that ball well, and your passes have to be almost perfect. So if they don't, that is what that's what you're looking at now, where you're giving up the most goals in the league because you turn over the ball in stupid spots because of a, a bad reception, bad touch, bad pass, whatever. And then you get punished because you're playing in a league where there are guys that know how to finish their chances. That's just what it is. So <clears throat> I also think the willingness to go out there and just put your head down and bring the energy like, the the homegrowns, the Tyler Wolves, the Machop Trolls, Nick Firmino, um, Caleb Wiley, you know, and, and and to their credit, there's a handful of other ones that like even when things get bad, they just don't stop running. Gootman and Lennon, like Gootman, I think he's had a rough stretch with his one v one defending, and I, I I would imagine if you were to ask him about it, he would probably say the same thing. But like, the dude doesn't stop. He still contributes as much as he – I mean, because he'll he'll have a really bad moment in 1v1, and the next thing you know, he's ghosted into the box and he's created a chance. I give him credit. You know, there's there's guys that are doing that. You know, people want to knock on Almada. My quick thing on Almada is, yes, is he playing maybe to the level that he was earlier the season? No. But also, he's having to drop back and do the job of two midfielders who are not moving the ball up to him as the attacking midfielder to allow him to do his job. So – He's having to take on entire midfields by himself. It's not fair to him to say it's all his fault. You know, in a, in a game like the Red Bulls, Yakimak is not getting the service, but he's still dropping back trying to get involved. And and if we're being fair, Miguel Berry was doing the same thing when he was on. But, like, there's something to be said for a 90-minute shift of just coming out doing that all the time and, and putting forth the extra effort, the the runs off the ball, the movement, that even when you don't have the ball, making things happen – and the motivation just for a lot of players doesn't seem to be there. And also, like, the fundamentals. You know, we're talking about the players specifically. You're not executing certain things that 
you've been taught since you were a kid, you know, and Pineda can't go out there and make better throw-ins. Pineda can't go out there and receive the ball for somebody. Pineda can't go out there and send in a better cross. Pineda can't go out there and take the shots. Like, he, he can't – he's not – that's not his <laughs> job. His job is to teach them and put them in the right positions, which is where his share of the blame, I think, lies, absolutely. But at the end of the day, these are professional footballers that should be able to adapt to – most any type of football that comes their way. Now, are they going to be perfect at it? No. Do I think the players that are in the positions right now are capable of executing Pineda's plan the way that we want them to and the way he wants them to? Not all of them. There's some of them, absolutely, but not all of them. But the biggest difference is where the hunger comes in with these young guys, they make up for the inexperience because they work and they fight and they never stop. And that's where... I'm so proud of the young guys. Yeah, and like it, you, you look at Brooks Lennon a lot, and you look at it with you know NTN, and then um, whoever he's paired with on that side, Aruju. Like he, you could tell the way that they look, and even like Gutman too. Like you know that these guys should be making the runs because they're like, why aren't you making the run? Why aren't you doing this? Like, you know that that's what they're practicing and these people, these players aren't making the runs. And so you could tell that they have a, an idea. It's just some of these, when they get out in the field, they're just not performing it. I look at the past couple of years and, and you look at how bad Atlanta United has been. And obviously it's been much better. But you look at it, and we've talked about this every single week, and, and, and you know that it's – they've got – it's it's individual mistakes over and over and over. And I, I see people wanting – I see people trying to, to mold it into to the narrative of this is Pineda's fault. Someone said his tactics were, were too difficult. But, like, they're just – like, you really need to watch the mistakes and just watch what's happening and, and think to yourself, like – why did he do that? Like, nobody's telling that person to do that, right? Like, just rant. Like, you could just think of random things. Um, I mean, you could look at who was our center back we just lost last year, or we, we got rid of last year. Uh, brain farts. Oh, uh, um, Alan Franco. Sorry. Yeah, Alan, thank you. You say you had trouble too. So, Alan Franco, like, he constantly just made these weird mistakes where he was just making bad passes, like, right? Like, he was just bad passes out there or just not defending extremely well. Um, George Campbell was another one that was just making some, some simple mistakes that were, you know, causing two on ones on Guzan. Uh, I mean, that, that was the thing. And then you look at, you know, these past games, and it's the same thing. And like, why did Prada make that pass? That was like, you could tell like that pass didn't have a chance to get to anybody. He literally, I think it was on the first goal, just passes it right to the middle of the field and it gets straight to the Red Bulls, and they and they come right on the attack there. Like, I, I can think of so many like right now. Like, I just thought of the, I think it was the Toronto game where they end up tying it. Like, all they had to do was keep the ball away from Toronto, and Machop Chol runs the ball out of bounds. Give it straight to Toronto. Toronto gets the ball, throw in, goal. Like, yep. these are things that it's, like, I, I don't understand why these players, I, I can understand why some of the kids can have some of these these mistakes but these veterans are just consistently having trouble making these these decisions and it's 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 there's barely anybody that you could really think of that uh, on this team that's that's not like brad guzan's obviously making some here where it's just he's out of character i haven't seen brad guzan in his entire career here run out of the box as many times as he has to go make some crazy run to, to kick it out there. Like, and I I don't know why he like, does he just not have confidence on his teammates and that's why he's doing it. They've, it it takes one moment to really have that, you know, to, to have something bad happen, but it's happening every single game. And it's not just one player. I mean, it's, it's across the board. There's maybe a couple that have more than others, but I don't know what the focus is here. And, like, again, go back to earlier. Like, this team doesn't seem ready to go at the beginning of the game. How is that possible? Um, 
you know, and, and there was another narrative on Twitter that maybe these people don't want, these players don't want to play for Pineda. Get out of here. Like these guys, you're, you have a transfer value, right? Like you have a value. It's not just within the league. It's in the world. You are not going to go tank your value in the world to, to not play, to, to, to stick it to the coach. You know, yeah. Almond is not sticking it to Pineda um, to, to lower his payday his big payday, right. you know, in the summer or the winter. Like, that's just silly. These players if, if are professionals. Ever, if you've ever seen a team that legitimately did that, it's obvious. It's obvious. Right. They're not doing that. They're not doing that. And and exactly, like, to your point, the biggest thing that's going to ever prohibit that from happening unless something goes really bad with a, with a coach is, like, hey, man, I, I want to get paid. Like, I'm all, whoever, but, like, I'm trying to go to Europe and get paid a lot more. Why would I why would I shaft everything only because I'm spiteful? Like that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Now you could have said that possibly last year when it would seem like it was the coaching staff versus Joseph Martinez. Cause it definitely seemed like there were some players that were picking sides just on their social media posts. And, you know, people posting Joseph gets suspended, you know, all of a sudden everybody's deciding to post their favorite Joseph thing. Like that's uncomfortable. And, and maybe yeah. you can, you can call that then, but like, that doesn't seem like it's it. He's a player's coach and maybe that's a little bit too much on him. But like, again, like the, these guys are just making silly mistakes at this point. And I think that that's the main cause here. Now, what do you do? Do you, you can't just transfer all these players out. Like you, you can't, I mean, but you're going to have to figure something out here and, I don't know what it is, but like benching players, like we've talked about, isn't easy in MLS. Like your your quality level of subs are are just not there, and it, you know I, I don't know. My last I mean, thing about the players, my hot take, my hot take on can I can I say my hot take that I did on spaces? Jose Tu should never touch the field ever again for Atlanta United, and I and I end my conversation there, ever. Well, I'm sure we'll discuss that more on Wednesday, but oh, don't. <laughs> um, but it goes back to that same thing, right? You got players that are hungry that want it, and if if sometimes you you might have to say, hey, everybody's going to ask why am I doing this by benching a certain player because of the backup that I've got waiting. But at the end of the day, the backup I've got waiting at least deserves an opportunity, right? Unless unless they've done something just drastically awful on the training ground. Like, if you got guys that are going out there and acting like they really could care less to be here, maybe they should be benched for a while. But yeah, yeah. it was a catch-22. No, and you bring a good thought. And, like, again, this is just us talking again. Like, one thing that, that does drive me crazy about Pineda, going back real quick to the coaching, is, like, there's not a lot of bold moves that really happen. Like, we thought it was a bold move when Josetu didn't start, you know, a, a few games ago, right? But it turned out that they were just resting him. Yeah. But, like, we talked about it. While other players are gone, here's your chance to really be bold. Bold in your decision-making. And Josetu has not been it. And you started him in this game. And he was terrible. Like, even the game before, like, I, I thought... I thought Firmino should have started. Like I thought that here's an opportunity, guys. Like DC's okay. They're they're not fantastic. Um, I, I wouldn't have started a Firmino in, in a Red Bulls game just because of the physicality and, yeah. and all of that. But I thought that DC game was was a was a move that you say, All right, you know what? I'm starting this kid. I think that he has it. He can really come in and, and start make an impact from the beginning. Now, he did come in late and do his thing, but you had that for the entire game. I think you see uh, a potentially even better result than than what you have there. It's just, I don't know. I, I feel like they, they need to make some bold moves on, on occasion. And it kind of just like you almost can predict every single lineup every week. And I don't know if that's a good thing with this team. Like you don't have a good enough team that you could just say, all right, you know, when you looked at old Atlanta United teams, you know what the lineup was going to be unless they were resting somebody. Right. Like because it was so good. Right, like it was just—it was hard to do that. You don't—it's we don't have that that roster right now, so you know Sadich and you know whoever, or maybe even Sadich even gets benched and you know they they play Ozetu. Like I I don't know. I, I I would like him to be a little bit more bold with with some of those decisions. And back to the players, 
benching some of those players that that aren't you know showing up that game because he said right that he's got to hold players accountable and we thought Josetu was and maybe he maybe he was maybe he was just being the coach that he is and was just trying to use that as an excuse on why that he you know benched him you know I don't know yeah I mean but those are all extremely valid points though because it's you know when you talk about being bold I think really the last time that we really were having this conversation was with Joseph and you know people might not like it but ultimately that was the right decision and and I, I, I hate that it had to be but it was the right decision there's a lot to be said about either somebody or a group of people in the locker room that are bringing everybody else down. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that's what happened with Joseph, but there just seems like there's a lot of clues that point to he just wasn't happy and Pineda made the hard decision. And that was a hard one because, I mean, he's Joseph Martinez. Build the statue, right? Um, now you've got guys who I think you can you can afford to just say, look, man, you're just not cutting it right now. That's not to say you're off the, you know, forever. But 100%, like, I'm going to play Jay Fortune. 100%, I'm going to play Tyler Wolf. 100%, you know, I'm going to play Noah Cobb at times. Whatever. That's There's nothing wrong with that. And if you are a player that gets – you might get your feelings hurt. But if you let that bring down – the player who replaced you or the team as a whole, then you don't need to be on this team. And I think that's how I would look at it. Now, you know, there's, there's a lot more to it than that. It's not, I mean, it's, it's easy to say it's very difficult to do, but at the end of the day, you just got to do it. You just got to swallow, swallow the pill and say, Hey, uh, you just haven't been enough. You haven't been it lately. And so we're going to try something different. And if it works, by all means, you have the freedom to fight your way back into it, but until they we, we have another reason to switch it back up, then it's on you to get get yourself back here. So, all right. Man, we're going on some monologues today, but it's good stuff. We told you yeah. we were going to give you the reasons why, which is why we want you guys to give you the reasons why. But we've done coaching slash tactics. We've done players. And now we move on to the front office. Poke out. <laughs> I can't imagine how many of those comments are going to be on here by the end of it. By the end of the week. I'd put a bet on it, but I'm not going to. Uh, again, lower number being it's less their fault. Higher number being it's more their fault. And to preface it, Tommy... We're taking into account front office for just what the past few years. Sure. Overall, I, I don't. I want to say. I don't know if we want to say overall because I think that things were going very well early on, and I think right. a lot of things have changed since since day one to now. Yeah. Okay. Because it's not. I don't think it's fair to just be like, "Oh, well, Goth Loggerway. He's been here long enough." So. Yeah. Reasonable time period. Past couple of years. Let's go. Oh man, this is so tough. Just to get the right number. All right, what you got? Eight point one. Oh wow, dude, eight. I, I I did. I had eight, and I wanted to make it a little bit higher than what I gave the players, because it's just we are paying for the the sins of the past. I, I feel like that's 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 a huge part of the, of this season. Because you, you've just had so many problems uh, across, and we, we still we we still have situations like, and they're fixing him right. Like you're, you're fixing some of these issues, and and Joseph Martinez, let's just take him out of the equation because he he's an entirely different situation. He had a random injury, and you go from there. Marcelino Moreno, like big contract trouble that you have. Like he's you you brought him on and. Now you go store him somewhere else. Barco, another DP. You had to go store him somewhere else. Like, it didn't work out. Like, you've got all these DPs everywhere. Now you got a situation where you've got so many U-22s that you're technically, your your roster is not compliant. 
like as soon as the window opens because you have to bring mascara back because you've got four U22s and you knew that Eric Lopez was going to have to everybody knew Eric Lopez was probably coming back at, at a point here um cuz he, he wasn't doing anything like you, you've had so many mistakes and and you've been having to clean them up for years right like you you had to find a way to you know you you had to use these buyouts for for silly situations you've you've had bad, bad contracts given out right like um Jurgen Dam my boy like you gave him an insane contract Brilliant. and I, I I don't understand like what I I love Jason Longshore so much like I've learned a lot just listening to him but when he told me like when when he mentioned like Jurgen Dam was was good at that time and and worth that contract. In what world? Like, you go back and look at these stats. Like, he, he was not that good before he came to Atlanta United. Like, but they signed him to this huge long term, which was really the problem. The keyword's long term. And th- this this front office prior overreacted to everything, right? Like, we just lost Joseph Martinez. What are we going to do? We're going to go sign the TikTok star of the world. That's what we're going to do. We're going to go sign Jurgen Dam. He's going to dance. He's going to fly, fly by people. And he's going to score goals. Didn't even do anything that great. Like on, on TikTok. Like it, it, I didn't find any of them that impressive. Like it, it's... Mediocre it, TikToker is what you're saying? We overpay for players. We, we've done that. And like Joseph, I thought Joseph was, was what he said um there when he was having trouble with Heinze a and then even trouble afterwards then just with the front office like he called it out like we, we bring players in that just come here for a payday they're they don't really want to play for this team he, he called a lot of things out that i thought was really good to really bring to light there but it's it's been it's been a lot of mistakes and i still don't think that Pocanegra will be here at the end of the year. I, I just don't, I think whether he goes and gets a job somewhere else or they put him into another position here, that is not um, the director. Like, I, I I don't know. It just, it. I, I feel like we've, we're one of the biggest spenders, but we're one of the dumbest teams really out there. And you lost your, your best recruiter. You lost your best guy that, that knows talent. You lost Tata Martino. You lost that, like, you could talk about Tato Martino and, you know, his coaching or whatever, but Miami is really gaining another guy that just knows where to go find players, right? Can convince players to come play for you. And we blew that up. We blew those players up, you know, because we were getting different coaching and um, these players didn't get along with coaches and everything like that. And it's it's just been one mistake after another. And now we, we've got to wait really to clear the space like this team is not terrible like i I don't think we we could say this team is terrible but if you were able to spend a little bit more money on some of these key positions we'd be much better than where we are we would be i know you always say about like talk about like we allow one less goal you know and we'd be better but like if we had one more good player right like one more above average we have a lot of average players on this team like i love sadich Sadage is a fantastic, I think he's one of the best bench players in the league. I think you, you have him come in on a one-off game, that's a great. And he's and I think he made a little bit of, of a boost there. But still, you, you've you've went out and you've paid Abram a ton of money, which still is, is already looking like a very odd contract. I know, again, he still hasn't played with Miles, but like still hasn't looked great yet. NTN, I still, everybody wanted him. Like everybody was interested in him. But we didn't expect that the price tag probably would have been as high as what it was. But you brought him in. But you are cleaning things up now. And I don't know who to really thank for that, right? Like, you can thank... I mean, you got Moreno off the books. Sorry. But, like, that that was a huge thing here. And, like, they, they planned it out, right? Like, they were kind of forced to buy him out right now. Um, I know. You're sad. Yeah. But like you were able to bring him out, like you were able to move him out. So like you've got a ton of space, like open up for this window. It's they've got to prove us. They got to prove us, right? They proved us by looking at Yakamakis and spending a little extra money to get their guy because that's who they wanted, right? Like Bocanegra is not the worst, like uh, because we talked about it. He Yakamakis loves Bocanegra. He's the reason why I came here. You know, like that's that's a big thing. You know, bringing in some of these young players. 
you know, he also has to deal with the academy, right? Like he is a part of the academy and helping run that. Like the academy's doing a pretty good job. We're yeah. starting to see like forwards coming in. Like we we've, we've always just seen mostly defenders. Like you're you're seeing people getting called up. We just had the game with the most uh homegrowns played in a game and we won. Right? Well, they drew. It felt like oh. a win. Oh yeah, they drew. I, I'm sorry. No goal. It but felt I mean, so good. I felt like we won. Oh yeah, my bad. <laughs> but like it, it was, a, and and they they all seemed to to you know somehow factor in on on, on these goals. So I, I I'm not sure where where this goes from here. But I think that we are we've been so deep in such bad cap space, and Bocanegra admitted to it before the season started. Garth Lagerway came in and said, "Yeah, guys, like we." We've got to clean these books up. We got to run this thing more efficiently. Like when he said that, he's calling out, calling out the past. Yeah. And that's what we're doing. We're we're still paying for these sins, and this window is just so big. And it's gonna be interesting if they go and they use it all now, or do they wait until maybe they they're gonna get a DP. They're gonna get that right. But like, how much money do they spend on this Moreno, freeing up all this space with Moreno? What are they gonna do with it? That's what's interesting to me. But I, I do think that this team should be better, but we're not because we just have to pay. St- we're still paying. How many DPs do we, I mean, we had the other day? Like, but before Moreno was gone, technically we still had. I, I Well, I know technically not to the window, but really Barco and Moreno are still well, here until Moreno the window opens. Down, but, yeah, I mean. But it, brought in as a DP, right? Yeah, yeah. So and and then you also did the same thing with Alan Franco as well, but he's he's been gone. But yeah, I think I don't know. Every time I think of the front office over the past few years, I always think of the term fiscal responsibility. And you know the thing is, Atlanta United has has money. They have Arthur Blank. What they don't have is the ability to throw money around like Chelsea. Because they can. There is a salary cap in this league. There are rules and very strict rules. So I gave them an eight because I do think that what Garth Lagerway is doing right now is a a huge step in the right direction. Uh, Absolutely. And I think his mindset just makes sense. You go after a player that has proven themselves in their position in multiple leagues, especially overseas in Europe, and they're at at a prime age to where they could still be here for plenty of time for years, but they have experience under their belt. They're not looking to necessarily make another move back to another, another big league or whatever. They're happy coming to play in front of, you know, 42,000 people every week. They're happy coming to a, a league that is admittedly growing very strongly. And I think you give him more time to, to keep cooking, to keep doing his job. You, you figure out the midfield spot. You figure out what you're going to do with this DP spot. You figure out I mean, you have money to play with now that he's he's freed up. It's like you said, the sins of the past. It's the past couple of years. You know, you, you've you signed some, some iffy contracts. You've let some players go that you probably shouldn't have let go. Um, things that maybe just didn't make the best sense or just didn't pan out the way that everybody thought they would. I mean... You know, in, in some cases, like, you know, there, there was definitely an upside to a player like Jurgen Dom coming here. On paper, there was an upside to having a player like Eric Lopez come here on paper. But they didn't pan out. And that's not to say, like, they're not going to hit on every player. That's there's nobody. There's no team that's doing that. It just doesn't happen. But your percentage has to be better, and your percentage gets better by following, I think, what Loggerway is trying to do now, which is just to be smarter about it, to bring in guys that are proven already. It's okay. It's okay to go get a, a young South American talent, a big one, and and make it happen. But you've gotten lucky, or you've you've hit well on a couple, and you've had a couple that didn't really hit so well. So, I think. You see definitely in the future some less of that. And as we as we as we move forward, I think you're gonna see a much more experienced roster for Atlanta United. I think a, a lot of what it looked like back in 1718. Not to say there wasn't good young talent, obviously, but at the same time, 
even the talent then that was young was still proven in a lot of ways. And but you had you had the the anchors on the team. You had the Nagbys, the Parkhurst, the Lorenowitzes. You had those guys that in the in Guzan that locked it down, and they kept I think the entire locker room level. And you have a little bit of that now. I mean, you got Yakimakis in there, and he's he's definitely somebody that I think most of the locker room looks up to. Obviously Gazan, but when we're talking about the front office, you you can't you can't look at it and say I think it's a positive sum at this point. It's going in the right direction, but there were a lot of mistakes made in the past. And and we on our shows we always give credit where it's due. Like you're just talking about Boca Negra. The Gutman deal. I mean, Gutman turned out to be a pretty good uh, signing the way that that worked out. Yakamakis, and of course, that was mostly Lagerway. Um, but you, you've had a handful that hit, right? I, I would even argue, and this may be an unpopular opinion, but I would actually argue that Pity Martinez was good, a good signing. But what, again, where the front office, I think, messed that up is they brought in a coach that was not going to fit with Pity Martinez at all. And he still, they still got something out of him. But that's where my frustration lies is you go through this weird cycle where you bring in the right coach probably with the wrong players. So then you try to bring in the right players for that coach and then you get rid of that coach. And now you're stuck with those players and you're just doing this flip flopping constantly. And that's what, that's my argument when I I hear people say Pineda out. Okay. I mean, if Pineda, if the team doesn't make the playoffs this season, whatever, like I think your, your arguments totally valid. Like there's definitely something to be said, but at the same time, like if you were to get rid of Pineda right now, you're tanking the whole season and potentially next season. So it is impossible to predict. It's not an easy job. It's not a job I would want to have. However, they've got to get better. And right now you've got a bunch of players that fit into different styles that don't really fit into this style. And that's because of decisions over the past three or four years. And here you've, you've just, you've got to have some consistency and you have to have somebody coming in with a game plan that knows what they're doing, and that's what Loggerway is doing now. So that's why I think it's it's good to be excited about the future, but it can't happen overnight. Yeah, and but it, we it goes back to though, like Tonto Martino wasn't gone yet, right? And they were already in, they pretty much already had it in that Pity Martinez was coming in, right? I don't think I don't think he wanted him. Like I don't, I don't. I thought maybe I'm getting him confused with Barco because I know he definitely didn't want Barco. No, he didn't um, I think most of the Pity Martinez stuff had kind of because at, at that point Tata had already made his decision; he was leaving anyway. Well, so. you, you know, it was being worked on prior um, yeah. as well. Um, I, I may, I, I probably just have it confused with Barco. But like, you have Barco, you bring in Moreno when you don't have a coach, right? Like, you're these spots are so precious, right? Like, you have to have the right guys and you're picking these guys without a coach like you're you, you've done this so often and like Aruju, like you were i know that was a last minute thing but like who really i mean panita was just coming in at that time yeah during a coaching change again right during a, during a coaching change in a season that was pretty much our well no i'm sorry they ended up making the playoffs that year um but like Barely. it's Right, uh, they 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 sneak into the playoffs that year. It it, it always seems like the front office and the, and the coaching staff have, have never been tight, and that's that's not the coach. You know, I I understand Heinze was a strong personality, but in most re, in most worlds, no matter what sport you're in, it's the front office's job to be working with the coach to be able to make the right decisions on the roster. It's not for, it's not the, the coach's job to work with the front office. No, it's the front office because they're the higher ones on the totem pole, right? So they need to be working with everything under them. And it's always seemed that that's been a disconnect. And I don't know what it is like it is right now. Um, but I feel that with how things are going now with Garth, that is going to change, whether it's Pineda or whether it's somebody new uh, it, it seems like it's going to get better. Now, I do disagree. Like, if they ended up getting rid of Pineda now, yeah, it, it could definitely hurt this season. Now, next year, I don't think so. Because Columbus just went out and got a, a new coach, and they're they're good. Yeah. They're doing really well. Like, you can, you can go find the right guy to, to put this together. Mm-hmm. and I, A proven coach, which I think right, is a, definitely something a, to be said. Yeah. A, like, a, if you go find somebody, a, a proven guy, and... Sometimes I still think that that is a potential 
thing that that might need to happen here and it's nothing against penny i know i, I gave Panetta a low number here and now i'm, I'm contradicting myself but I, st- I think that felipe made that comment a while back about like do you give the keys to the the car or whatever to uh, you know uh, this big fancy card to a kid or yeah. whatever it was whatever the analogy was like I do wonder, like, I understand you've been burned by these big name coaches, but like, I think you can find a good coach and be able to keep him here for a long time. You know, money, money does a lot. Giving him control, right, is a lot. Like, you just saw the Hawks go and bring in one of the best coaches in the league. But what did they do? Like, how did they convince him to do that? They gave him a lot of they gave him a lot of like calls on the players. Like they gave yeah. him a little bit more than what they gave their previous two co- coaches for the Hawks there. And like you can do some of that now. They did do that with Heinze, right? Like Heinze was able to pick basically the U twenty two spot goes op- open, and Heinze is just like, all right, let's go. <laughs> oh, I got a DP spot. I want the defender. I want, and it took like three three tries to get it, yep. but he eventually got the guy that he wanted, and they definitely overpaid for it. But I think you could go find a, a really good coach out there that's not named Burhalter. Just I want to make sure just nobody <laughs> thinks that there's any Burhalters uh, here. But you could go find a good coach and be able to br- – oh, my gosh. Like, <laughs> you, you, you can go do that. But, like, it, it's got to start there. This front office has got to start there. They, they've got to be working with the coaching staff, picking the right players that they want for the system that they want to play. And there's been a lot of, like, little – there's been stories out there by Felipe and Doug. And, you know, when you read into it a little bit, you could definitely tell, like, you could. there's a disconnect in that entire front office. And I think that if that if that changes, I think then we're really doing we're doing a good job. But the, the big when you look at teams that struggle throughout the years, there's a huge disconnect between the coaching staff and the players. And usually just the, 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 the front office stays and the coaches go and they hire another coach. And what happens? that coach goes and then the next coach goes and then you have to just wait until the front office is finally fired because it's easier to blame the coach than the front office. Yep. Always. And that's, and now you've got two minds, whether it's, it's Bocanegra or someone else, like now you've got two minds that know about the league, right? But Bo- or Garth's going to know about the league. And if Garth hires someone else, they're going to know about the players. They're going to know about the league. They're going to be able to be able to bring players in here. We've said it. Darren Eels is a great guy. Love Darren. He wasn't a, a player guy. He was a business guy. That's what he's good at. He, he, he didn't. You maybe he could go, you know, spit some ideas off of Darren Eels. But like Darren Eels isn't an expert on that. So now you've got you're you're basically taking your you're taking your brain trust and multiplying it by thirty people right now. I mean, you're getting everybody in there. But as far as right now, the situation we're in, this is this is mostly on the front office. Absolutely. And, and I think it, it, you know, it reflects in our numbers, but, uh, this is a good chat though. This is a good conversation. And I, I think everybody's going to have their opinions with this. That's just part of it until the team gets back to winning probably the way they should and play into the level that I think the fans expect. That's going to be a conversation. There's going to be blame to go around. You're going to be playing the blame game. Plenty. Who knows what happens this season? The entire conversation could be a moot point come, you know, what, October? Because Garth Lagerwood goes out and has a, a banger of a summer transfer window. And then, and then we're having a different conversation. Who knows? But right now, as it stands, there is blame to go around. Y'all let us know if you agree. Because we, we want to know. We want to hear from you guys. And we want to know why. Don't just – we prefer for you not just to say, you know – suck it everybody like fire the whole thing like we want to know why we want reasons um but at the same time we appreciate you guys we appreciate the support we appreciate uh you guys listen to this because this is a long one for the player player ratings video quote unquote player ratings video uh aka the blame game but we thought it was time we thought it was kind of proper at this point because it just uh i think it's at that point of the season where you're sinking or swimming so uh that being said on behalf of Tommy and his botched plastic surgery, make sure you go. F- <laughs> make sure you go follow him at Tommy ATL ninety six. Follow myself ATL Pilgrim. 
Who do we have on Wednesday? Huh? Who do we have on Wednesday coming up? Uh, well, it's not verified yet. Oh, oh, I, never mind. We, we have we Tommy have and somebody. Sydney, and well, it's yeah, it's it, we're getting somebody back from MLS, uh, another announcer, who probably is going to have ties to the next game that's called, but I will not name names yet because it's not verified. But definitely be back here Wednesday. Um, but yeah, make sure you follow on Sydney as well. He's he's uh, off enjoying a Braves game uh, at SH Rights, and follow us on uh, YouTube, Twitch. Patreon.com slash Carbs and Spikes. Always good stuff. We have stickers that are here. We have other stuff. I'm we checking the Brave score. <laughs> we have Tommy spying on people. I, well, I, was seeing, well, I wasn't watching the game. I was just seeing if like Sydney's having a good time. Like yeah, if, if they're... I don't know. It started playing out loud. Oh. Uh, no, the Twins are beating the Braves one nothing okay. at this moment. So Sydney is not having a good time right now. But Nope. He will have a good time when he comes back and hopefully sees all this good conversation that you guys bring to the comment section. And other than that, we will see you guys on Wednesday with an MLS uh, announcer. We're going to be hanging out. I'll not tell you the name yet, but we're going to talk about this game uh, against Red Bulls. We're going to talk about the Philly game. And we're going to talk a lot about the Academy and the twos because they are having a killer week right now. Their past seven days have been outstanding. So we Somebody see, is. Yeah. At least somebody's having a good time. Yeah, always. There's always one of them doing good. They're bringing home some silverware. So that's all you can ask for. But until Wednesday, guys, 7 o'clock, be there. We will see y'all then. We appreciate all your support. Have a good one. <laughs>